this morning only at verses 11 down to verse number 16, but you know that the entire story goes all the way down to verse number 32. And in order to set this up a little bit, let me uh, just ask you to put on your imaginations for a few moments. And I know that some of you won't have to put on that much of an imagination because you have a son at home, but I want you, if you have never had the experience of having a son, I want you just to imagine what that is like for a moment. I mean, just imagine, for example, the announcement and the excitement that you get when you find out that you're having a son. Now, a daughter, they are special, right? I don't want to exclude any daughters in the room today, but there's something different about a son, right, men? And and if you're too scared to answer because your daughter's around, then I'm sorry. But there's something different about a son. There's something special about a son. Uh, You know, sound the trumpets, a child is born. That's our mindset. There's a great joy that comes in a parent's life as they hear that little boy cry for the first time, right? As they celebrate the wonderful blessing of God. Again, not that it doesn't happen with a daughter, but there's something special about a son. At least it was for us in our home. As the months pass by with the adorable chunky feet and the two or three chins that begin to develop, which aren't as cute 50 years down the late, the, the road, but they're cute at the moment, right? The heart-wrenching smiles, the cooing, the, the laughing. As the child progresses, there's those constant adorable moments in years one, two, three, four, five, and on down the line. But then something happens. Those early childhood years of sensitivity and training, they, they always they, 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 they seem to produce some great moments. But then all of a sudden, one day, something happens. And that is what we know as adolescence, right? And at adolescence, that child, that son, that was all, all filled with all of those, the, the glory and the future hope and, and all of that cooing and laughter and all of the things that we remember so well, When they get to adolescence, all of a sudden, every parent at some point turns to their spouse and says, what in the world happened to our son, right? That's this story this morning. It's a story about a man who had two sons. It's a story about a man who probably, in the birth of both of these sons, thought to himself, man, I've got a great future planned out for them. He was apparently a fairly wealthy man. He was a man who had apparently tried to give his sons as much as he could. And you might imagine, like any good parent, he was imagining what they might turn out to be like. But then all of a sudden, a day happens in his life that is unexpected. A day happens when one of his sons, his younger son, comes to him and he has a request. Listen again in verse number 11 down to verse 16. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger uh, son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, it says, uh, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Verse 15, so he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And I want you to underline verse 16, it's special. And he was longing, the son was in this moment it says, he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one would give him anything. This man's world was turned upside down in an instant. When his son came to him on a particular day, and maybe out of the blue, maybe he had sensed some trouble brewing for some time. But on one particular day, his son comes to him with one of the most shameful requests recorded in all of Scripture. In verse number 12, the son comes to his father and he says, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. Now, why in the world would he have done this? You can understand what he's doing. He's coming to his father, and he's requesting an early inheritance. He's requesting an early draw on what he's going to get later in life. Well, the reason that he did this probably comes down to one of two things. Either A, first of all, the son might have known the temperament of his older brother and thought, if I'm ever going to get anything from my father, now is the time. 
You see, in their world, it was a dog-eats-dog world like many times ours can be as well. And sometimes the older sons who were entrusted, according to the Old Testament, with the responsibility of divvying out the inheritance to the younger siblings, sometimes the older brothers were not very good at dividing equally. In fact, the Old Testament gave the prescription that they were to divide everything out by thirds. He was, he was, the older son was allowed to keep a third, and everything else would be divided out amongst the younger siblings. Apparently, this younger brother might have known something about his older brother. In fact, we get a glimpse into what that might have been in verse number 28, which we haven't read yet, but it's his response to when the younger son comes back. We get an idea that this older brother might have been a vile, might have been an angry, might have been a selfish older brother. And so the younger brother might have said to himself, you know what, if I'm ever going to get my father's inheritance, I better request it while he's alive or I'll never see it. Or the second possibility is that he was just a a selfish younger child in the family. Everybody turn and look uh, to the youngest child in your family and say, you the baby of the family, right? Maybe this one was the baby of the family. He got all the special attention. He got all the, 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 the extra effort. In our home, we still call Zariah baby, right? I'll say, come here, baby. And and finally, the other day, Isaiah says, she's not a baby anymore, right? You can't do that, Dad. Babies of the family, I I know I'm one of them. We, We tend to get a little bit more than everybody else, unless our older brother's screwed up, and then we gotta pay the penalty for their sins. Amen, all the younger children. What is wrong with you people today? You know what I'm saying. The younger brother might have just had a silver spoon in his mouth all of his life, and maybe he said, you know what, I just decided that I'm worth it, and I'll ask my dad for this, and he'll just give it to me. Maybe he had a selfish tendency. By the way, when he said to his father, Father, give me my inheritance, he was essentially saying in that moment, Dad, I wish you were dead. I'd rather you not live and I get what you have because that's far more valuable to me than anything else, than time, than energy, than, 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 than our moments walking out amongst the farm. Listen, more valuable to me is my inheritance. Dad, would you give it to me now, even though it's not the right time? Whatever the reasoning was for that younger son, why ever he wanted to make that request and why ever he wanted to say what he said to his father, the point is that it was extremely unordinary. It was out of the bounds of socially accepted behavior. At this moment, the younger brother is probably a teenager in his life because the story goes that he was unmarried and that he is going to, later on, we're going to find out that he spent some of his money on prostitutes. And so he's probably a teenager making a conscious decision to run away from his parents' home and to start his own life. Now, I know you adults in the room never made such decisions when you were teenagers, but now that you have teenagers in your own home, you can relate to what's going on. Am I right about that? You know how this teenager has decided they know better than mom and dad. They know better how to live their life. They know better how to make decisions. In fact, dad, if you would give me my inheritance, I know better how to use that inheritance than you could ever possibly do. He was deciding in that moment that he knew how to run his life better than his father did or his brother. He was in charge and nobody and nothing was going to tell him what to do and put boundaries to put shackles upon him to guard his living as it were. Not only that, but it seemed to have an attitude of entitlement along the way as well. That is that he believed that this inheritance was something that was owed to him. He says, give me my inheritance. He didn't say, Dad, I'd like to have what you think you might give later on, but he said it in a demanding way, give me my inheritance. You owe this to me, Dad. Then we go from there, and that takes us to the Father's response in the second half of verse 12. It's not what we might have imagined. The younger son comes in all of his bravado and all of his brashness and all of his rudeness. And he says to the father, Father, give me my inheritance. Give me what you owe me. Give me what I want. I would rather you were dead. And then the verse says, and he divided his property between them. According to Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 17, 
I said it wrong earlier. The younger son would have received about one-third of all that his father had in this moment, assuming that there was just two sons. Now, the request being shameful should not have been handled in this way. When the younger son came to the father and said, Hey, I want this. I think I deserve this. I think you owe this to me. He should not, the father should not have said, Okay, I think I'll do it. I think I'll give you your share. You see, there are two typical ways in the father's time, in the time of this writing, where a father should have responded to his son. And the first was that they had the option of public discipline. When the younger son came to the father, the father should have said, Listen, I don't have time for a selfish, whiny baby, right? And all the dads in the room know exactly what this response is like. You say, I don't have time for you to act like this. If you want to be a big boy, you got to start acting like a big boy. He could have brought, brought him even before the elders of the city and began a public display of discipline. We know it today as what we call shunning. It's not particip particularly participated in in many communities today, but there are still some that do it. There is this idea that, that the father could have, in this moment, said to his son, you have been so arrogant, so rude, I am casting you aside as though you were not my son anymore. You won't get one dime turned his back on him and chosen to act as though he didn't even exist. In fact, here's a free one for you. Out north of town on 65, there's a little church called Mount Hermon Baptist Church. Outside of Mount Hermon Baptist Church, there's a cemetery called Mount Hermon Cemetery. Did you know in Mount Hermon Cemetery, there is one particular lady who is buried twice? The story goes that this girl, she, in her teenage years, decided she knew how to run her life better than her parents did. And so her parents, being that time in, in, our, in our history, decided that they would shun her to the point that they actually held a funeral service as though she had died and they buried her. A few years later, after she had decided to return home to confess her sin and to be reunited with her family, she was welcomed back in. And then when she died, she was buried next to where she had already been previously buried. So in some extreme cases, communities will actually treat someone as though they were dead. This could have been the father's response. He could have said of his son, man, you are an arrogant, selfish child. Could have brought him before the city and said, I can't control him. I can't uh, deal with him. I, I don't know what to do with him anymore. So we're going to go on as though he were never alive in the first place. Second thing the father could have done was even more drastic than that. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 21 beginning in verse 18. Listen to what the law writer says. He says, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother... And though they discipline him, will not listen to them. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This is our son, stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and drunkard. Verse 21, Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So shall you purge the evil from your midst. And all Israel shall hear and fear. We wrote these words on a tablet and put them above our son's bedroom so that he may read them every day. This was a drastic case, but God was saying actually that this was so evil for a child to act in this way, it would be proper to purge him from the community by literally stoning him to death. So here's the request. The son comes in his selfishness, in his brashness, in his rudeness, and he says to the father, Dad, I feel entitled to your inheritance. I've decided I know how to live my life better than you. Why don't you give that to me now? And the father had two choices. He could have publicly disciplined him by shunning him, or he could have had him killed. But instead, Jesus says that the father gave him his inheritance. He divided it out. However, the father was supposed to respond. He was supposed to respond in a way that recognized the stubborn disobedience of a child. And a death sentence or public shunning, even casting them out as though they were dead, were to break the heart of the, of the son, were to speak to him about the severity of his decision. But we're surprised when we don't see the father respond in that way. Or maybe we're not, but the people who heard the story would have been, would have been surprised. 
They would have thought to Jesus, Jesus, this is a bad parable to tell because this is not a father who's giving us a fatherly example. We know how we should have done this. Instead, Jesus says that the father just honored his son's requests and he delivered up his property. It's as though he said to him, go ahead and see, do what seems right to you. Now, before we go any further, we have to back up for a moment. We have to remember that Jesus in this context is speaking about the salvation of the lost. He's speaking about the kingdom of God and its discovery because first of all, he told us about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one walked away and 99 were left so that he could go and find him. Then he tells us the story about a woman who had 10 silver coins and she lost one of them and she began to ransack her house until eventually she found that one. And, and at the end of both of them is that they celebrated. They brought their friends together and they told them, I had lost something, but now it is found. Then immediately Jesus tells this story. The story about a man who is losing his son. But there's a difference here. And the difference is that the sheep seems to have wandered off in stupidity. The coin seems to have been lost in the carelessness of the master. But now the son is walking off. He's wandering off. He's being lost in the stubbornness of his own choices. He willfully and arrogantly, wantingly walked away from his father. And therefore, it becomes a story about the caring nature of God our father. A God who when one stubbornly is or when one is stubbornly set on going a, a path, leading their own way, despising the care of their, the, of their father, rejecting the authority that's placed over them, decides to wantingly go on their own way. A father who determines that even though I know this is not what is best for you, if you have set your mind on these things, then there's nothing I can do to stop you. Go ahead and go that way. It's a story about a father who watches his child make his mistakes and waits for him to return. Beloved, I have thought about this story so many times over the years, even in my own life or as I've counseled other parents who have dealt with difficult situations in their homes. I have so often times, so many times said that the father loved his child enough to let them go. Love them enough to allow them to walk their road and to make their decisions, even though they knew what was best, even though they knew what was not best for their son in that moment. It's a story about a loving father who, when his son had his heart set on, uh, on, on desiring to, to go in a different way, and the father says, I'm going to give you what you need to go on this journey, and then humbly waits for him to return. Don't be naive this morning. This father is in no way condoning his son's actions. He's not saying, I agree with what the son is doing. He is instead very broken hearted. In fact, we see that in his, in next week in his response. He's standing there at the gate. He's waiting for his son to return. Not only that, but just stop for a moment. Remember, I told you there are two ways in which the father should have dealt with the son. One of those being that he should have publicly shamed him, and the other being that he could have literally had him stoned to death. But that the father did not do that now meant that he brought shame onto his own self. In other words, I know nobody at Cornerstone Baptist Church ever does this, but those people looked at him and said, he's not a very good parent. If they would just get control of their child, if they'd just give him a spanking every once in a while, we could have this solved, right? <laughs> Some of us have said, hey, send your child over to our house. We'll take care of this for you. Now, we didn't say it to the parent, but we said it to everybody else. The father would have gone through his own shaming. People would have said, you know, this guy doesn't know how to raise his kids. He doesn't know the law. He doesn't know how to deal with the Old Testament. This guy doesn't know how to deal to bring his kids back into the fold. But he was broken over it. And yet he knew exactly what his son needed in this moment. They would have thought that he didn't know how to handle his children. But the father knew his child better than anybody else. A father, nonetheless, who was willing to bear the shame in an effort to see his son make his own mistakes and return home. As Paul Harvey would say, then came the rest of the story. In verse 13, here, listen to what happens. Uh, after the son has made his request and the father has divided the property, it says in verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and he took a journey 
into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. We might have expected that, right? First comes that phrase, not many days later. It seems like the son had it all planned out in advance, right? It's like he knew what he was going to do from the very beginning when, when he set the plan into motion of going and asking his father for his inheritance. I think he already knew where he was headed. I think he already knew what he was going to sell. I think he already knew what he was going to ask for. It was though he had everything already worked out before it had actually come to fruition. As soon as the father said, okay, I'll give it to you, not many days later, he goes, it says, gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. One bad decision is now leading into another bad decision. He's chosen to leave his father's home and house and the protection that would be there. And he's decided that he's going to go and live his life wherever he wants, however he wants to live it. Maybe it was because of public shame that he was leaving. Maybe he thought, having done this, I know how people are going to view me. I better get out of here before anybody else watches. I can't deal with the way people look at me, right? Or maybe it was just the arrogance of his own heart. He was now deciding he had had to he, he was now deciding how he was going to start this new life and live his life and, 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 and execute this plan. He would see that nothing and nobody would stand in his way. Gathered all that he had speaks there in the Greek of him taking his property that was given to him and cashing it all in. It's as though he took everything and put out a big garage sale, right? Put out a big garage sale to see who was willing to come and to buy and offer a fair price. You see, this is when he already began to squander his parents' inheritance. This is when he began to squander what he had. Not when he went to the far country. It actually began the moment he started selling it. Just stop and think with me for a moment. Whenever you got to get something, get rid of something in a hurry because you want to get somewhere, what do you do? You offer it at a lower price. You want to inspire people to move on it. You want to inspire people to, 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 to pay for it and, and get on down the road. Not only that, but his inheritance probably would have been property, judging by what we see in the rest of the story. And, and the last time I checked, God wasn't making any more land, right? So it's difficult to even get property, and yet here's the son, and he's just selling it all. He's getting rid of it. That property could have produced more increase year after year if he'd chosen to farm it, right? He could have increased his wealth. He could have increased his abundance. Not only that, but the land, just being land in its very nature, would have increased in value. He had all these things working for him, but in the arrogance of his heart, he said, I know what is best in my life, and I'm going to do what I want to do. Nothing and nobody else is going to get in his way. He's just sold in in the arrogance of his youth. He's decided that he knows how to do things. And he, I think, wrote the original song by Frank Sinatra, I Did It My Way. And when he got to his destination, Jesus says, after he got there, he squandered his property away in reckless living. You know what that word squander means, don't you? Essentially means that he just threw it all out. As though it was garbage, head into a garbage can. He got nothing out of what he spent it on, he just threw it away. He threw it away by living recklessly, and that is without concern. That's the words, the terms that Jesus is using in this moment. It's as though he just threw it away recklessly. He didn't take the time to even weigh the cost or to figure out how much he had. He just threw it away recklessly. This week, Isaiah got his first opportunity to go on a youth deer hunt. And for you PETA activists, I'm not going to talk about the hunt itself, okay? Uh, But before that hunt, we went into Walmart and we bought his deer tag. And then uh, Brother Chuck calls me and says, hey, you need to take Isaiah up to Stone Laser Imaging and register him for the youth hunt, uh, and they'll give you $8.50 back for the tag you've already purchased, and they'll sign you up, and, and you'll get your name in a, in a raffle, and, and, and you'll be able to maybe win a gun or win some, uh, some door prizes. And in the long tradition of Guffy Luck, he won nothing. There's like seven kids that didn't win anything. Mine was one of them, right? So anyway, so we go up to Stone Laser Imaging and he shows the the man his tag and and Harry says to him, well, get the man some money and they hand him $8.50. Now that means nothing to you but to a six-year-old, glory to God, he is wealthy, right? 
I mean, he is like, man, dad, I can, is this my money? Do I get to keep it? Well, it wasn't your money that bought the tag, right? He says, do I get to keep this money? Do I get to use this? And I was like, you know what? I'm being kind of giving today. Yeah, you can have the $8.50, Isaiah. Now, that's the difference between dad and mom. Mom would have taken it back. But I said, no, you can go ahead and have it. Son, it's all yours, right? So the next stop we have to make is at the grocery store because we're having deer camp in our living room. Some of you saw this on Facebook, right? We built a tent out of a couple chairs and, a, and some blankets, right? And then Zariah wanted to stay there, but she got kicked out because we don't want no stinking girls, amen? So we built this deer camp. We, we go to, 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 to Woods, I guess it was, to, to buy, or not, not Woods, Bings, I don't, I don't know, whichever it was over there by Kmart. We went to buy some, some stuff to make some chili, right? And no beans, amen? No beans. Make some chili. And we go in and we get to the register to pay off everything. And the lady says, who's going to pay today? And I said, the big boy right here. He's got $8.50. And he turns and looks at me and says, do I really have to pay for this? I said, absolutely. You going to eat this chili? I don't really like chili, Dad. (laughs) I mean, to a six-year-old, this is an inheritance of a lifetime, right? This man, this young son, probably along the way when he got his inheritance and he got it all gathered together and he sold it all off, I don't know what the amount would have totaled, but I'm guessing that as he got that money, he thought to himself, man, I could live a lifetime on this. I don't need any more. I could, I've got so much. I could just throw it all away. I could be reckless in my spending. I could squander it. And it doesn't matter because I've got a small fortune. And he probably did. He probably did have a small fortune, but he did not recognize what it was going to cost to live life this way. Squandered it away recklessly. Just threw it away. And it was fine for a while until verse 14. We come to verse 14, and Jesus goes on with the story, and he says, And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to go in need. He would not plan for the famine. See, any good farmer knows that there are some years that are very plentiful, and there are other years that are not as plentiful. Some years you make a lot of money, and some years you don't make as much. And so if you're going to be in business for a long time, you've got to, Learn how to stock it away and prepare for those difficult years, right? His father, probably being a wealthy man and a wealthy landowner, probably he knew how to do that. He probably had learned over the years some business sense about how to put some away. And and when the weather was bad, when, when the crops weren't good, he would know how to survive those years. But this young teenager son, being unmarried, spending his money however he wanted to, well... He had not prepared for the famine. He had not realized that maybe life wouldn't always have the same conditions that, there, that, it, that, that it was at this moment. He thought to himself, I, I think probably at one point as he's spending the money, I'm guessing somewhere along the way he thought to himself, boy, I've lost a lot here. I, I better ought to be more careful about this. But then he probably thought to himself, well, I've got plenty more. I know how to make money. I know how to get some more. But then that famine came in, something, an event that he was unplanned for, something that he wasn't prepared for, and it comes in, and all of a sudden, for the first time, he realizes just how destitute he is. I don't want to belabor the point this morning, much beloved, but once he was the son of a wealthy man, he was probably not in need for five minutes in his entire existence up to this moment. When he was hungry, he ate. When he was thirsty, he drank. When he was tired, he took a nap. All of his life had been lived, uh, he had lived however he wanted to live. Then the son, he was the son of a king essentially. But now the Bible says that when he had spent everything, listen to this, he began to be in need. It's almost as if the, this was a prodigal famine. It's almost as though, or providential famine. It's almost as though God had sent this famine to make the son realize just how much he needed He was in need for a long time before the famine ever existed, but it took a famine for him to realize just how lost, just how broke, just how destitute he really was. It was a famine that was going to bring him to the end of himself, and it will. In verse 15, he goes and he hires himself out. Specifically, we're told that he hires himself out to a citizen 
uh, uh, of, of the country. And, and anytime you're going to hire yourself out, guess what you got to do? You have to determine what your value is. When you go and apply at a job, most of the time, unless you're really hurting, you don't go and apply at the job and say, listen, I'll, I'll take minimum wage. I'll take very, 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 very minimum. I'll take the very lowest that you would offer to me. Most of the time what you do is you walk in with a dollar in mind. That dollar represents what you believe is the value you are bringing to the table. I'm, I'm worth $10 an hour. I'm worth $15 an hour. I'm worth $20 an hour. I'm certainly worth more than the preacher is on Sunday mornings. Amen? I, I've got a value that I associate with my life. This young man had a value that he associated with his life. And now think about it for a moment. This is a son of a wealthy man. He lived his entire existence in wealth. And now in this moment, he finds himself in need. And he has to go and get a job. And when he goes to get the job, listen, he valued his life as that of a pig. He says, I'll tell you what. I'll go and I'll I'll work your pigs. And he sells himself, Jesus says, to a citizen of the country to go out and to take care of his pigs. That value wasn't very much, especially for a Jew. We assume that this young man was a Jew. See, in the Old Testament, pigs were unclean animals, according to Leviticus 11.7 and Deuteronomy 14.8. He wasn't allowed to really be around them. But you see, in this moment, the young man was so desperate. He was so desperate that none of that mattered. The ends would justify the means. He would sell himself out. A Jewish boy, picture it. I know it's hard for us. But a Jewish boy, God's chosen people, the child of a king, now he was selling himself to a Gentile citizen there in the land for the purpose of wallowing in hog slop. That's when you realize you've reached the end. You realize you've reached the bottom. What a mighty fall he had taken. As though to put an epitaph on the young man's grave, Jesus adds these concluding remarks. He says, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Find this interesting, beloved. The young man had to put a value on his life when he applied for a job. But you know what happened? What else happened? The culture put a value on his life as well. The man whom he was working for said, you are not even as valuable as the pigs that you're serving. A son who once held the world in the palm of his hands now longed to eat a pig's meal. But the most indicting part was, not, was that nobody would even give him the pig's food because he wasn't as valuable to the farmer as they were. Beloved, do not be surprised, for this is the hidden secret of sin this morning. It really does not care for you at all. Sin doesn't. It's fun when you have something to offer to it, but when the money has run out, when you have to offer, when, it, when what you have to offer has been taken away, It kicks you to the curb, and it sees you as absolutely valueless. And I want you to hang on to that until next week, because we're going to pick it up as this young man comes to the end of himself. But what are the first couple of verses about? What can we learn from them before we even see his response? Well, the first couple of verses, they tell us the story of sin and arrogance of the heart. You see, beloved, I, like the prodigal child, like many of you, like all of you, really, if we were to be honest, we had the world in the palm of our hands. If you go back to the beginning of time, Adam and Eve literally had the world in the palm of their hands. In the garden, man had dominion over everything. God gave them dominion over everything. The birds of the air, the beasts of the field, the, the, the plants in the, in the ground, the fish in the sea. They had dominion over everything. And they could literally do anything that they wanted to do except for one small thing. God said, you've got the world at the palm of your hand. Just don't do one thing. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge. But you and I decided through Adam that it was better for the father not to give us any excuses, not to give us any any boundaries at all. We know how to live our own lives better. And so Adam and Eve said, I know better than God what is best for me. And even though God gave me everything except for that one tree, that one tree is the one thing I want. Beloved, if you've raised children, you have seen this. Our our, our children, I mean, I'm the first to say our kids are spoiled rotten. I mean, just spoiled rotten. They do not understand what it means to be in need. 
They do not understand what it means to not have things. They, they have a, a playroom with so many stinking toys in it, right? I can't wait till our next move so I can bring a dumpster and just start throwing it all away. Amen. Okay, never mind. They got so many toys in that room, but I'm telling you, every time, every day, Isaiah goes and he grabs one toy that he wants out of that room, and as soon as Zariah sees it, even though he's been at school all day long, and she's had the entire day to play with whatever she wants, as soon as she sees that Isaiah has it, that is the one she wants. The moment she knows it's not hers, that's what she wants. Adam and Eve did the same thing in the Garden of Eden. God said, you can have anything here. You can eat of anything you want. But one thing you can't do, don't eat of that tree of knowledge. And Adam and Eve, in the arrogance of their hearts, said, We know better than you. That's the one thing we want. And beloved, you and I are not any better. It was not merely Adam's sin in that because we do it on a daily basis. In God's word, he gives us a rule book for living. How it is that we'll be most blessed, most satisfied, most content in life. He gives us a prescription for an inheritance that is more precious than than the imperishable things of the world. But we arrogantly so many times decide that we will be the master and commander of our own lives. We're told that it's noble to pick our own destinies, to be the self-made man in our culture. We're bombarded with stories of people who took the bull by the horns, pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, and did things their own way. We have even written songs about it, right? We have Toby Keith singing, I want to talk about me, I want to talk about I, I want to talk about number one, oh me, oh my. How many of you listen to country music? Show your hands. Listen. Hey, man, be at the altar this morning. Every one of you need to get saved. Kelly was listening to that song the other day, and I thought, man, I'm going to use it in the sermon. We sing songs about how we want things our way. We foolishly decide that we ought to run our own lives, run our own path. The verses that we've read this morning tell us the story of a father's heart. They tell us about a father who was broken and poured out for the love of his child, yet submits to the pain to allow the child to go through the pain of his own bad decisions. The father knows where the end is at. He knows where these bad decisions are going to lead his son to. He watches as his son begins to squander away what a great blessing it must have been. While he wheeled and dealed for the best that he thought he could get for, I'm sure the father was sitting there going, man, that's, that's not good. Don't you think when the son advertised in the, in the Johnson auctions that, that his land was coming up for sale, don't you think that the father sat there and thought to himself, son, that land's worth more than that. Don't do it. Don't do it. This is a bad choice. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna squander it all away. This is a bad decision. Father knew where the end was at. His heart was broken as he watched his child sell off small fortune made me think how God's heart must break as he watches his children take what was intended for our good and we try to sell it. Made me think of what God thinks about when he watches his children squander away things. For what do we sell it? Well, we sell it for what this young man sold in a few moments, maybe of reckless living. And at the end we find that we've only squandered it away, thrown it away, God's blessing, such foolishness. The verses even tell us just how far we have to fall. We always think, I think at least in my life I do, that there's this safety net, this imaginary net, right? Something that's going to come in at just the right moment and save us from our folly. But instead, what we see in this moment was that the father loved the son enough to bring him to his end. The father loved the son enough that he said, you know, if it's going to take that, then, then I'm all about it. Just go ahead and let it happen. The son wasn't the product of a bad economic environment. The famine did not create the problem. It only served to show the son how far he had fallen in the first place. And eventually we come to that place in our own lives where we have to evaluate our lives. We have to decide how much we're worth. And where we once stood as the son of a king, we find ourselves comfort in just eating the food of an accursed livestock. We find in that moment that even those pigs are worth more than we are in our state. So I would ask you this morning, where do you find yourself today? Are you a child who's just beginning his rebellious descent? 
having stubbornness and arrogance in your heart, now's the time to stop to see where the road is going to lead, to use this parable as a reminder, hey, don't go this way. Have you collected your blessing and you're traveling on that long, distant road to a distant country? Stop, turn around. Now's not the time to go. You're not going to be happy when you get there. Or maybe you've spent all that you have and you were given now, and now you feel like you're more worthless than the pigs. Listen, get out of the slop this morning, the mud and the mire. It's time to go back home. It's time to come back to the Father. You don't have to run this full course of sin. You can return, but you have to come back humbly, and that's going to be where we pick up next week. This son has to come to the end of himself. And I'll leave you with this thought this morning. It took all of these things to bring him to that point. I was thinking about this a little bit this week. I have a beloved friend that we've been working through some difficult scenarios with and just trying to work through it all and I won't highlight all of it it's not somebody you would know but we we're trying to work through all these things and and just just get it taken care of and seeing how some people's sin affects other people and we're just we're just trying to work through it all and one of my other friends that was involved he said do you do you think it would be better if the authorities just charged them and went down the road And they had to spend some time in the jail. Or would it be better if no charges were filed? And I said, that's that's a hard question to answer. It's a hard question for me to answer. Because where I'm at today is, I want to see this person at the end of themselves for God's glory. Because I know until they get to the end of themselves, until they realize just how destitute, how, how, how sinful they are, how sinful they've become, then God's not going to work in their life. And so there's a part of me that says, you know, whatever it takes, go down as far as they want to go. Whatever it takes, bring them to the end of themselves for God's glory. This morning, beloved, I would ask you where you're at. I have to ask this question of my own self regularly. Am I really at the end of myself? Especially, by the way, when things are going well. Because when things are going well, you tend to just kind of operate in your own strength, your own conditions, your own power. But as we're going to see next week, this son had to come to the end of himself. He had to realize there was no other hope anywhere else before he could be used by the Father. Beloved, where do you find yourself this morning? Maybe, I hope, you're not finding yourself as one who's walking down this path. If you do, use this story as a reminder. Hey, sin does not want to give. It only wants to destroy and take away. And as soon as it's done with you, you'll be wallowing in the mud. Stand with me reverently and let's pray.